How does Jesus get people to remember his message better? That's what we're going to find out in Matthew 13. All right, welcome to the podcast. We're just going to have a few announcements in the moment. After some consideration and some advice from someone who is listening, they suggested that I don't fill out section two of the podcast sheet because you're supposed to read it and fill it out for yourself. This whole podcast is section two of the Ramps Bible study sheet. So I decided that I'm going to just keep the blank format there. You can download the blank Ramps sheet, fill it out for yourself, listen to the podcast. You're getting my analysis, my Ramps study. But it's more important that you fill it out for yourself than to have me fill it out because, again, this is my interpretation of it. It's how I see things. I still fill it out for myself. Every time I do an episode of this podcast, I have a fully filled out sheet that I'm working with. I don't use exact transcripts when reading the podcast. I talk about my ramps Bible study sheet. Second thing is the website is up and I have moved all the podcasts, the blog articles, everything over to the new site. The Bible in small steps.com is available and ready for you to use. And the next part of it is I just wanted to let you know that I've noticed the podcasts are long, longer than I expected them to be. And I don't want to repeat so many things for you that you lose track of the main story or you feel like, gosh, Jill, you have said this three times. And listening back to some of the podcasts, I feel like I have said some of those things three times. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do more of a consolidation of the A and analyze. Instead of answering these direct questions, what is the main point? What is the main point is what I just got done talking about, obviously, because those were the main points. I will call out literary bits or allusions or parables. I will call out what does God want from us? And so the idea is, is that I'm going to try to consolidate this more. So I'm only saying the thing once and not repeating it over and over again. I felt like I said, listening back to it, it felt too repetitive. And when you already have a podcast that's going on for a little bit, it starts to get dull. So that, that's just a little bit of housekeeping. I may go back and edit the previous 12 podcasts to be more concise, just so they aren't so long and again, not repeating itself. But if you have opinions about this, if you have something you would like me to hear or a way that formatting this podcast would make it better for you, please let me know. Again, I want this to be good for you. And these changes of having both the ramp sheet blank so that you can fill it out, which is the goal, is not to have me paraphrase the whole Bible, for, but for you to study it. But then the third part is consolidation. So it's just one story, one of the times. I know I just repeated all that twice. So that's the goal. Let's get on to talking about Matthew 13. So where do we just come from is that Jesus was naming his apostles. He instructed them. We also had a run-in with the Pharisees who were just hanging out in a wheat field waiting for Jesus to do something they didn't like. But now they have had it with Jesus, and so they're ready to take him down. Jesus starts teaching from a boat. I think he was going there to get quiet time, but his compassion led him to start to teach. He starts off by talking about the parable of the sower. And a parable is like a story, an example, a proverb, a wise saying, and th he starts telling these stories. When I was thinking about it, and I like parables, I kind of operate in a parable's form. I cannot remember details to save my life. Like if you ask me when the War of 1812 is, I have no idea. When is Cinco de Mayo? I don't know. But you tell me a story, I will remember it for the rest of my life. And I think that's what Jesus is going for here. If he tells people the story of the kingdom of heaven, if he tells people parables about what they should be doing or not doing, they will remember it better. So my process in all of this is I read the chapter and then I have logo software and I have 10 commentaries lined up for each passage. And so I read the chapter by myself so I can get my own impression. And then I will look at these 10 different commentaries to get different views. And they vary based on literary outlook, theological outlook, maybe facts and details. One of them has a lot of details about what famous people said about this particular passage. And so I look at those and try to see, am I on the right track? Am I like completely off base? Or are there a variety of different ideas? And the reason I'm telling you about this is this particular week, I found the different opinions. 
So we'll talk a little bit about these parables and then I'll mention why people differed in them. First of all, he said that this is a very famous parable that the sower went out, sower being God, and threw seeds on the ground. Some of the seeds were eaten by birds. So it never even took place. It just got taken away. Some of it went on the hard path, which can't grow anything. It's too hard. It's just matted down soil and it can't grow at all. It gets kicked around and then shoved off to the side of the road as people walk by. Some of it goes on rocky ground, which means it's still ground. It still has some soil and the nooks and crannies. Plants can grow inside of rocky paths. They just don't do very well at all. And then they spring up because it can grow there. And then it just died because it couldn't build enough structure inside this rocky area. Sun beats down. It doesn't have the infrastructure of a plant strong enough to continue the plant to grow. And it just dies. Isn't that fun? Way back in that time, of course, we knew how plants worked. And he's talking in a way people are going to understand again. The next seeds fall into thorns. So you already know this is a fertile area. There's stuff growing there already. Stuff can grow in this particular ground. But thorny, weedy things are fast growing and it just chokes off the good plant that the sower sowed. So eventually the plant just dies because everything else is crowding it out. I have a yard full of weeds. I try everything I can do to get them to go away, but all they do is choke off all my good plants because I'm a terrible gardener. That's the image I get, is that you plant something, you think it's going to grow, and then your weeds just take over and kill it off anyway. Then some other seed fell on the ground in good soil, and then it turned into good grain. And then he says, for he who has ears, let them hear. And you're thinking, what does that mean? We all have ears for the most part. What do you mean? And he's saying, I think that there are people, and we see it all the time, where you talk, and nobody's listening. It's not soaking in. They're not listening to what you're saying. They're not responding to you. I mean, I got accused of that today, that I wasn't paying attention to something someone was saying. He's saying, pay attention. He is asking us to not just listen to his words, but let them soak in. Then he explains why he's telling these parables. He gets asked, why are you doing this? And he says, because there are people who hear this And they don't understand the secret of heaven. It's not that it's a secret. It's it's a secret in their own brain. They don't understand what it's talking about. They're not piecing together the deep conversation here. So you've seen situations where, I don't know, maybe like in lit class, right? In like eighth grade. And someone will say, and then to kill a mockingbird, the parable, it, it represents the, and everyone's just like, I don't care. I'm not thinking about this. I don't really care. I just want to pass the test. I think that's what he's accusing everyone of. They're not thinking about this parable. They're not thinking about what it means. And so it's a secret to them because they have ears, but they're not hearing. Then he mentions more prophecies by Isaiah. This one is uh, 6 9 in this case. And he says that people's hearts have grown dull and that their eyes are closed. But if people hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, they would be healed. They would get this. Interestingly enough, a couple of the commentaries talked about people's hearts hardening when they confront God. And also this week, Father Mike Schmitz on his Bible in a Year podcast talked about it's not God hardening people. It is people hardening themselves to what God is saying. So this commentary from Bob Guzik and also Father Mike Schmitz said, so it must be kind of a famous thing, when you have the sun, if you're wax the sun melts you. It warms you. But if you're hardened ground, the sun turns you into hardened clay. You can't get in there. And so even though the sun is the same thing, with different materials, it has different reactions. And I think he's saying to some people, you're not letting the soak in. You're not listening. You're not letting your eyes see, your ears hear, and your heart feel the message. For you, there will not be healing. But for the people who do melt in the right way, they're going to get it. And he says at that point, people either walk away. And I always figure, too, that in any situation, people either walk towards or away from God. And he's saying, if you're walking away, if you're hardening your heart to this message, 
you're going to lose more than what you have. Then he talks about prophets. The prophets hoped to see what these people are all seeing right now, which is the Messiah right before them. And all of them wanted to see this moment. And they don't care, the people listening and watching now. But he says, blessed are your eyes who see and your ears that hear. This was the hope of the prophets. This is a thing the prophets for all those centuries was waiting for. Then he says, when the word of the kingdom of heaven is told, some people just don't get it. And that's what this parable, now he goes on to explain the parable. So the devil steals it like the birds steal it. It goes on the path, like I said, and it just falls away. The rocky thorn is someone who hears it, but cares about the opinions of the world. The rocky path are the people who initially are like, yes, Jesus, this is amazing. And then they just walk away. They're the rocky ground. They started out enthusiastic and then they just never went anywhere with it. Makes you wonder about the crowd. We always talk about the crowd. There were so many people following around and watching Jesus. How many of them ended up in Jerusalem not supporting him? Then comes the part where the seeds are choked out by the thorny bushes. and. In my mind, when I first read that, I thought, how many of us look to the word of God, look to be exposed to the word of God, and then we're all like, oh, cool. Did you see the latest game where we get to kill everybody and bow down to pagan gods? Oh, look at that video. That guy is practically naked and those women are too. It makes me think that now when I look at the world, I should just see thorn bushes where it is something that would potentially separate you keep you away from the word of God. You are about to get choked out. Boy, that is a definition of today's world in every way I can think of. Then he says that he, a man sowed seeds, and then when he was sleeping, the enemy sowed weeds. That's what I think is happening in my yard too. And when the time for the harvest comes, they see some of its weeds and some of its seeds. And so the workers are like, hey, should we separate those out now and just get rid of the weeds? These were called Darnell and they were poisonous. Not your job to separate it. And it's not going to happen until the day of judgment. Don't go in there and start ripping people out who you consider to be weeds. Don't go in until the day of judgment. The angels will come down and bring up the wheat and throw away the weeds. This is not your job. And so when I read a lot of commentaries, this is where I was saying there was some disagreement in it. They were talking about how, you know, it's the angel's job. This means that you're not supposed to prune your church of people you don't think deserve to be here. You're not supposed to go around and judge people who are wheat or weeds. What struck me, and I don't know if there's any theological basis of it, is that this doesn't happen until the day of judgment. That means we give people all the time that God gives us to stop being a weed. We always get that choice. We always can stop rejecting God. God is offering that gift of salvation. We just stop rejecting it. We stop being the weed. And so God will give us the strength to do it. But if we keep rejecting, we're never going to get there. So in the end, it's not our job to be the separators. And God's grace is going to give people time. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that grows and becomes a large tree where the birds build nests in the tree. Here's another place where the commentaries disagree. Some people say, those birds building nests, I like birds, but he says that's the evil one that steals away seeds and, you know, pecks at fruit and wrecks the tree. Other commentators are just like, no, you know, a tree that is strong and big enough will have birds nesting in them. It is just showing you the immensity of the tree. And the point of the parable is that the seed of a mustard plant is so tiny, but look how big it will become. And one of the passages I was looking at was saying, you know, don't get so caught up in the minute details of these parables. When he says birds, he's not necessarily saying it as a sign of evil. Try to understand the main story. Don't try to get so picked over on these little tiny things. Then came the story of the woman who hid leavening inside of about 50 pounds of flour. Interesting thing about this story is, first of all, this amount of flour that is mentioned in the Bible, this would feed a ton of people. And what most people believe is this is just saying, again, 
something very tiny that you can't even see can make enough food to feed 100 people. 50 pounds of flour. Isn't that amazing? It's like that kingdom of God. It's going to expand just by this tiny seed. Some people said the other way. No, because leavening is considered to be bad in Judaism. And so this was saying the evil is going to expand. I don't know about that. Leavening is only bad during the time of Passover. It's not bad all year long. People ate bread. They just didn't eat leavened bread during Passover. So I, I'm going to side with the people who say that this is an image of the kingdom of heaven growing from something so invisible like yeast and how it can get mixed in, mixed in with the people to grow an entire kingdom. And he says that his parable telling is related to Psalm 78. The idea I get is that he is trying to talk to real humans. If you're a farmer or a fisherman, you get the story. And not only that, because it's in story form, you're going to remember it too, which is nice. And then he explains it and says he's the good sower and the evil sower is the devil. The harvesters, again, are the angels. And that when they're separated, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom. And then he says again, it, he who has ears, let them hear. Again, listen to this. Let this soak in. Let this reach your heart. Quit ignoring what the story is about. Then he gives another parable about the kingdom of heaven being like a hidden treasure. And someone finds it buried in a ground and does everything he can, sells everything he owns so he can buy this plot of land. And then the treasure will be his, meaning he's going to give up everything because this one treasure in the earth is worth more than everything else he owns. If he would take it out of the ground, he would have to give it to the landowner. So instead, he is going to do everything he can to own it. And again, that is this message that the message of Jesus is worth everything. When he's talking to the Pharisee who wanted to join him, and he said, you won't have a place to sleep. A box has a den, a bird has a nest, and I have nothing. We'll see when he talks to the rich young ruler, give up everything you own and follow me. This is valuable more than anything. Then he talks about a pearl of value, meaning an exquisite pearl, and that the person sold everything in order to buy the pearl. Same story. But again, he's telling the same story in many different ways, so you get it. So you understand what he's talking about. And then the last parable is that he, it is like throwing a net into the sea and you get fish. And there's good fish in there, good to eat fish, and there's bad fish. And when the net is full, then it gets sorted out. The angels are going to separate it just like the weed and the grass. They don't separate it out while they're fishing. So if we're going to be fishers of men, we're not going to look at someone and say, nope, that's a bad fish. Ooh, that person over there, that's a fantastic fish. It's not our job to determine the good fish from the bad. It is the job of Jesus to separate them out, and the angels will do this work. So then he finishes, he goes back to Nazareth, and he teaches in the synagogue, and people are amazed. Man, is this the hometown guy? Look at what he's done. This is a son of Joseph. And the idea here, too, is that they talked about, you know, being a carpenter's son. In a way, it's a bit of a slam. Man, you know, this guy is saying these amazing things, and he's just the son of some craftsman. I was <laughs> reading more of the commentaries about it, they think the word carpenter was kind of a misimpression of it. When you're in England and you're translating the Bible and you talk about a craftsman, because England is full of trees and wood, a craftsman is going to be a carpenter. In most cases, when you're in the Middle East, and I can vouch for a lot of this, there's not that degree of trees in the same sense. Everything is made more typically of stone. And wood is used, but stone is more used. And so people feel like Joseph was probably a stonemason or just a craftsman in general, not just tied to carpentry. But anyway, so basically they're saying, gosh, is that that, that one craftsman's kid saying all these remarkable things? And Jesus said that a prophet is never honored in his hometown, which is a saying in the Old Testament from Jeremiah 11.21. Whenever you saw prophets in the Old Testament, he usually got run out on a rail because they were saying something hard. And then he didn't do his miracles, his mighty works, it says, because of their unbelief. All right, 
So that is chapter 13, the main details. And again, this happened about the same time as it's been happening, around 29 AD. And this is happening in the general area of Galilee, but at the very end, he goes back to Nazareth, his hometown. And we see mostly Jesus in the crowd. We see him telling parables to the crowd and explaining to them, but he's also saying hard things to the learned people because they're not seeing, they're not listening, they're not paying attention. And so you can tell there's probably some Pharisees in this particular crowd too. He's giving the message of what is important, when is it going to get separated out, and how this is going to grow in the future. And what this says about God, it says that God is, first of all, not going to separate the weeds from the wheat until the very end. It's not our job. It's not the church's job. It's the job of God to decide who is wheat and who is weedy. And the other thing that God wants us to do, he says it a number of times in many different ways. He first says it in the way, he who has ears, let him hear. Pay attention. Listen to me. And then he says it again, blessed are your eyes for they see, your ears they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it and hear what you hear and did not hear it. People are not paying attention. This message is not secret in the sense that God is keeping it from us. It is secret in the sense that people are not caring enough to even think about what he's saying. And what does it say about people? (laughs) You think again, it's a pretty dire message that we can have the most valuable thing in front of us, Jesus, and disregard him, not listen, not pay attention, not let him into our hearts. And when we do that, we're going to be poorer than when we were before we met Jesus. But it also means, too, that we can be different kinds of soil. And which kind of soil are we going to be? Are we going to be the thriving wheat? Or are we going to be the person who had it and lost all of it because they got choked out by the world? Or are we the person that's so hard we don't even care in the first place? I think that's what it says about people. And we have to think about what kind of heart we have in this particular piece and whether or not we're really listening. And because he repeats it a number of times, I think for me, the main message is for he who has ears, let him hear. Really listening, really seeing, and really letting it come into your heart. For my meditation for this week, I think that we can think of ourselves as good soil or thorny soil because we have so many things going on. But I bet you it feels more like a day-to-day, minute-to-minute kind of behavior. Am I in this place to receive the word of God in good soil? Or am I hard today? Or am I excited about God? On Sunday, my pastor got me revved up. But by Friday afternoon, I'm ready to have a good time. Or I'm letting the world choke me out. Where am I in this story when it comes to the seeds and the sower? My prayer is that I will hear, I will see, and I will let my heart accept the message of God and be melted by it instead of being hardened and rejecting his word. And what I plan to share is that Jesus is trying to grow something in us. And we have to consider, again, what kind of soil we are, because it's going to determine what, what kind of crop we're going to become. And I think, too, I'm going to use that imagery of the thorn bush more and help share that with people. So then when they see something that is choking out God, instead of seeing things as good or bad or as sin and not sin, maybe it's not that bad, but maybe it is a thorny bush keeping me away from the word of God. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. Again, the thebibleinsmallsteps.com is up and running. I'm still working on it a little bit, but now it's available. The feed, nothing you have to do, is gonna get converted over to the Bible in Small Steps. So this will now be our main source. And I'll start building some other things, places that you can find this podcast. Again, all the sources that use the Apple podcast directory will have this. All the places that use Google, Amazon, Spotify will have this podcast, and then I'll see about getting it into other places. But you're always welcome to listen to it on the website, thebibleinsmallsteps.com. You're also able to see this on YouTube. There are videos for every one of these podcasts, 
that are just um, pictures of the logo with uh, an audiogram on it. I'm not quite bold enough to do my own videos live and in person. But if you have anything to say to me, email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.